I would like to welcome everybody to Zoomcast number three. Hopefully, we're getting the hang of this. Uh, as always, I would like to introduce my co-host, uh, Steve Wade. Now, I always say that he's my former boss, uh, but make no mistake about it, Steve is always going to be uh, in charge of everything that we do. So, Steve, what's up, my friend? Well, in charge of everything we do? Okay, I'll take that. Don't you forget it either. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, Rick, actually, I got to tell everybody, when it comes to this, when it comes to everything with the scene vault, and the Zoomcasts, and the podcast, and the attempt to archive everything that Cena has done over the years. It's all you, man, and you are the man in charge. When this goes on, all I am is your spirit carrier, and I'm happy to be that. Well, if, I, if I'm in charge, that explains a lot. <laughs> yeah, it explains how, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> <laughs> And also, uh, as you've been uh, hearing, listening in on some of our conversations, uh, this week we do have Rick Mast on the call with us. Rick was the winner of nine Bush Series races. Count them. Nine Bush Series races. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine Bush Series races before he moved on to the Westy Cup circuit where he won the pole for the 1992 Hooters 500 at Atlanta Motor Speedway, NASCAR's greatest race, as well as for the 1994 Brickyard 400, the first NASCAR race ever held at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. But in all seriousness, more than that, he is absolutely just an all-around good guy. He has always been one of the good guys. I've always appreciated his friendship. So, uh, Rick, is, is there anything that I've left out? Yeah. yeah. How, how many wins would it take and the got put in the book? I was <laughs> going to ask that very same question. <laughs> I mean, nine, nine wins that I couldn't get in your damn book, man. I'm, excuse me. <laughs> get your dad good book. Oh, okay. All right. Man. Somebody's already asked about the backstory to that, so we'll we'll let you know that story. You just left me out. <laughs> you just flat left me out the friggin' book, man. That's it's very simple. Okay, all right. Well, our our guest for next week is going to be. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, look, I I, I see how it's going to go already. Okay. Okay. So let's go ahead and jump into some questions for Rick. Um, okay. Justin Hall wanted to ask a question, and as soon as I can find him, I will unmute him. Justin, fire away. All right. Hello, Mr. Mass. Thanks for coming on tonight. What's happening, my man? So I wanted to ask you, it was before my time, uh, can you tell us about the differences in the Bush series going from the V6 to the V8? Yeah, it was big time difference. I remember the first time I got in a cup car was 1988. Buddy Baker got hurt and he was driving the Red Burns Pizza. He had his own team and he got a head injury and he, I subbed for him for two races. First time I ever got in a cup car. So we go to Bristol, my first time in a cup car. And I, I go out on the track and I run around a couple laps, getting warmed up. Then I remember coming off turn four and hitting it wide open. It threw me back in the seat. You know, I go into turn one. I turn the steering wheel. It doesn't do anything. It's like it goes up the racetrack. It finally gets itself turned in the apex. And I get in the gas and it wants to jump sideways. And I turn the wheel to correct it. Then I have to feather the gas because it wants to break the rear wheels loose with all the torque and finally get it straightened out and come off the corn, come off the turn. And I, I run, I ran maybe six or seven laps like that. And oh. uh, I, I came in the pit, I came, I came down pit road and Joey Knuckles was my crew chief, our buddy's crew chief. And he put the window in that down. He said, and he always called me Bub. He said, Bub, or, I don't know. But anyhow, he said, what do you think, Bub? What do you think, driver? I said, Joey, I said, I don't, that's the first time I've ever been in a cup car. I said, I don't really know. I said, but this is an ill handless piece of crap I've ever said in my life. He said, really? I said, yeah. He said, what's it do? I said, well, you go in the turn and turn the wheel and it doesn't do anything. It just slides the nose. 
And I said, once you get it turned and stopped and loaded and through the apex to get it turned and get in the gas, it won't hook the rear up. You got you, you got to be real careful with the gas and feather the gas and you got to work the steering wheel and do all this. He said, what would you do to fix it? I said, man, I don't have a clue. It's so far out in left field. I don't have a clue what you do to fix it. He says, huh? He said, what would you say if I told you you were fourth fastest out of everybody that's running so far? I mean, out of the whole field. I said, fourth fastest? He says, yeah. I said, okay, I just got to adapt to this, right? I got to adapt to this race car. Because it reminded me of when I was running dirt. Uh, we ran big block, well, we called them big block modifies, but they were they were stock cars, but had big block engines. And those, those engines had a lot of torque. And that's what that car reminded me of. So... With the V6 engines uh, in the Bush series and the weight of the car, completely different animal. It was a completely different animal. The way you you just had when you got when you got out of the Bush car into a Cup car. I mean, you were in a different world, totally. The cars. I mean, the the nature of the racing is the same, but the way you had to to, to to finesse a Cup car and actually drive it and manhandle it, always slide. You're always sliding one into the other. Either the front tires are sliding, or the back tires are sliding. You're feathering the gas. You're working the steering wheel. You're all over the place. And that's what it, it took. I mean, that was the difference in those days. You know, now it's not quite like that. Right. Thank you. That's good. Yeah. yeah. What's that hat mean? That, what is that hat? That's Never. a light company. They make flashlights. Oh, cool. Cool deal. Company. Okay. LED okay. charge up. Yeah. Kevin Harvick. He must be, he's your man. Yeah, Delane I, is more my, Delane is more mine more than Kevin. So. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Damn boy. <laughs> Damn boy. Damn boy. All right. She wears a parachute. Yeah, yeah. So what Logano said. That's right. That's right. That's right. All right. All right. That was all for me. Thanks. Oh, thank you, sir. Glad, glad you checked in, man. Sir, our next question is for is from Brian Hallman. God help us all. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing, Mister Mask? You raced against hey, Brian, um, what's up, my man? You raced against Delana's dad, didn't you, John Limble? I did, John Paul. Yep, and and her uncle yeah. Dicky. Yeah, okay. they sure did. They that, were good guys. That wasn't my question. <laughs> that wasn't my question. I didn't want to waste it on that. Uh, you, you ran almost 50 Bush Series races, which from 1982 up, uh, Bush Series, it was late model before that. You ran almost 50 races before you went to your first super speedway. Was that by design or was that just because of needing a speedway car? No, I, I, I need a speedway car. I did not have a speedway car. We uh, actually, the story of the Franklin County deal where we won the $25,000 bonus and I got the bad check and ended up getting 12500 I used that money to go to Banjo's, bought a chassis from Banjo, took the car, the chassis to Robert G. Robert G. went to the junkyard and get the hell out of here, cat. Boy, oh, cat. Anyhow, Robert G. went to the junkyard. Robert G. went to the junkyard and got a bunch of parts and built the body for me, put it together, and we were able to then run uh, the big tracks. So, you know, and, and the funny deal in those days, guys, you run the short tracks, and you could you could be a prolific winner or whatever, but you really you really didn't get noticed in Cup uh, until – or you weren't really – how can I say this? You had to prove yourself at Charlotte, Darlington, Dover, Daytona – those places because what happened with me we run all the short tracks and a lot of guys running short tracks we had prolific winners in our deal very good race car drivers but when you when you went to a super speedway that's when you learned as a driver number one i can do this or not okay because not all the short with with uh with the speedway super speedways and so when you do that and when I, I started running, I think the first time I ran one was Charlotte, very comfortable, Darlington next to Daytona, and it all worked good. We, we always ran – I always ran better at the big tracks than I did the short tracks. And come and find out later, the reason was all these guys were cheating real bad on short tracks, and I wasn't cheating. So that, that's kind of what that was about. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. 
it, it appears that we're also joined by Ricky Mast. Ricky, really? How are you doing, sir? You got Ricky Mast on here? I got Ricky Mast on here. I don't see him anywhere. Well, I can see you, and I can only see – I was just signing on to ask why you got your camera angled so that we can only see the top half of your face. Also, where are you hiding the donut sticks in the pantry? That was my other big question I was going to ask. Well, y'all got to tell yeah. me this stuff, guys. I don't know what I'm doing with this thing. Uh, <laughs> what are you doing on here, Ricky? This is for race fans and people. What are you doing on here, man? You got your old stuff to do here in a little while. Well, I'm a race fan, too. I'm down – one see – you're recording where I usually record. That's what that's my green screen sitting behind you. So I've moved down to the basement because I yes I do have a podcast recording to do here shortly. But I was just signing on to check check in on you and see how you're doing with all this. That's Took all. Me ten minutes to get this Zoom thing going. Yeah. Also, serious question: Where are are you hiding any donut sticks in the house anywhere? I am. I am. And you're not going to tell me? Oh, well, I know what I hide them and then tell you. What, what sense does that make? Uh, none, I guess. All right, I'll go ask Katie. Maybe she'll tell me. <laughs> well, I have a question. I want to know how I can get on, get in on the Rick, on the Rick Mass cast uh, once every six months deadline. Uh, you know, you 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 put out a podcast every six months, so that's a heck of a deadline. It keeps the people in hunger, Rick. Oh, is I mean, that what you, you give it to them all the time, like you do. Yeah, I mean, if you give it to them all the time, it's just like that, ah, you know, no big deal. But if you space that thing out long enough, I mean, the people just clamor for it. And when you finally <laughs> give it to them, it's like, it's like good Lord and mercy. I mean, it's a good deal. Do it that way. You ought to think about that. Okay. I, I might have to give that a shot. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, our next question is from Edwin Turner. He wanted to know, uh, well, Edwin, I'll just let you ask the question and, you know, uh, 20 minutes from now when Rick stops talking about uh, everything, uh, we'll, we'll go to the next question. So, Edwin, fire away. Okay. Hey, Rick Mast, uh, hey, watched you during your career, career, but I keep seeing the – you answered it sort of, but I want to go in a little more depth maybe. Okay. Uh, so, I keep seeing back and forth about you giving – Mr. Houston, a hard time about you not being in the book. And they, you know, there's that one page, he keeps showing your little picture there where you said you're leaning beside the right side of the truck. They even okay. started making me wonder. I said, Am I, are my eyes wrong? And that's not Rick Mast or, uh, so I guess you just got your feelings hurt a little bit about that. Well, you know, I was, I'm used to that. You know, I was used to that. A lot, of, <laughs> a lot of, a lot of, some of the, most of the older writers in those days, they respected all of us, you know, but some of the times you'd have these younger, young bucks come along wanting to be prima donnas and they would just, they would go, they would go uh, for it. You know, the, the obvious answers. I mean, the obvious people, you know, they would go for. And by the way, that Ricky was my son. He's here, by the way, Rick Houston. He's, Ricky's here at the house with us right now because of the virus. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, okay. But anyhow, uh, you know, it, it did. It, it kind of hurt me because, you know, we felt like for, you know, almost a decade, we're integral part, integral, yeah, part of that, of that series. And, uh, you know, not to be mentioned, you know, it did. And, and I didn't really know Rick that well at that time, you know, and obviously he didn't know me or who I was. So, you know, but now after I've got to know him a little bit, uh, you know, I don't hold ill will towards him like I did for a long time. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Well, I have the book myself. Yeah, that so. is me. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry, that is me. <laughs> yeah. Picture at the, at the yeah, back it's starting to make me wonder, but yeah, thought I was going to, you know, my eyesight. I'm I'm in your age range, so I thought I might have to get out the magnifying glass. <laughs> I understand? I understand. I don't know where that picture came from. It was. It's a deep. I think it was. That came DJ from DJ and a bunch of others in that picture. That came Who? from Conway. Do you remember him? Oh, okay. 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 Yeah. That's how our driver's meetings were in those days. They had that, they had that like ton truck with the box body on the back. That was a Bush series truck. And Robert Black would get on the back of that truck. The doors open. We'd all gather around him standing and he would give us, you know, the, what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do. That, that was our driver's meeting in those days for years. Yeah. 
these are the kind of stories we like to hear. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> oh, you're welcome, sir. Thanks for calling in. Okay, our next question is from Bob Ellis. Rick, you gotta get faster at this stuff. Hey man, look, it, it's, I'm, it's, I'm one it's, man it's, band here. I am a one man band. Where's Wade at? Oh Lord, I just <laughs> I just taught I just taught him how to get on Zoom, man. Much less deal with the bells and whistles. <laughs> I, I taught him. We taught each other. So um, you know they used stone, the stone, and they hammer and chisels when he started writing. <laughs> Heard Ben Hur. Hello. Hello. I, yeah, I yeah. like Ben Hur. Say hi. Say hi, pup. Say hi. <laughs> Say hi, pup. Thank you there. Steve Wade, my man, my hero. <laughs> Steve Wade's everybody's hero, by the way. If y'all didn't know Steve Wade. He was everybody's hero back in the day. Well, thank you, Rick. I do have a question for you, if you can hear me. Oh, yeah, I got you, babe. All right. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit because I'm going to let all these guys ask their questions after this one. This is obviously yeah. toward the end of your career. I'm not going to ask you about the damn cow, okay? <laughs> I do... <laughs> I do want to know uh, uh, about the carbon monoxide. When did you okay. first start feeling that? And when did it become so debilitating that you basically had to walk away from racing? What time period was that? And how did that feel during that time? 7 o'clock, 7 a.m., Friday morning, March 24th. <laughs> Bristol, Tennessee. And that answers I that. Up, I woke up in the motorhome, getting ready to go start the weekend at Bristol, practice. On Friday morning, I felt bad. When I woke up, I just felt bad. You know, just didn't, just felt queasy. And I'm like, well, you know, got a little bug or a little bit of food poison or something. So Friday, he did the whole deal practice. Saturday, we qualified, did the practice qualify. Sunday, same deal. Wake up Sunday, feel about the same. Run the race Sunday. The race is over Sunday and feel bad. Monday, I feel bad. Tuesday, I feel bad. Wednesday, I feel bad. Thursday, we go to the week. Next race, I feel bad. And every day, Steve, it would get just a smidgen worse from March 24th yeah. till we get to Charlotte in May for the All-Star race. I ran the 40-lap invitational race, the preliminary to the All-Star. Uh, I ran that yeah. race, 40 laps. When the race was over, it was all I could do to get from my car to, or from my race car to the motorhome in, in the infield. And, you know, I immediately got to the motorhome, jumped in the plane, flew home, called the team owner, called my sponsor, said, listen, I don't know what's going on. They've been testing me for probably five or six weeks at this point. The doctors had already been working with me. And uh, I said, I don't know what's going on. I kept it a secret. I don't know what's going on, but I cannot race next week. I said, no way I can run a world 600 or 600 miles. Al, I couldn't even run 40 laps, you know. So that led to uh, – tons of doctor visits, which I'd already been doing. Uh, finally, uh, got in the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville. I went down there, three or four days of testing. They said, we suspect the link to carbon monoxide poisoning. I'm like, okay, what's that mean? Well, we don't know. Found the foremost expert on this stuff in uh, Dearborn, Michigan, Warren, Michigan, Dr. David Finney. Went up there, dealt with him. He sent me to a clinic in Colorado Springs. I was out there for five days for all this intensive testing, and they figured the whole thing out. And uh, it was a relief because it answered so many questions, so many things I was going through, different things I was having. And uh, they pinpointed it all. You know, they pinpointed every bit of it. Now, we're talking, we're talking, this is what, three months or so after Charlotte before all this happened. Because when I came back from Charlotte that night, I laid upstairs in my bed for 31 days. If I could get from my bed to my couch or keep a bowl of soup down a day, that was a real good day for me. Okay, so wow. 31 wow. days of that crap finally f started getting better enough to where I could at least get up and function during the day. And then uh, during all this processes, processes, the doctors, my local doctors are still running all the tests and doing all the stuff. Couldn't come up, come up anything. But over a period of time, got well enough to be able to go to Jacksonville and go to Michigan and then go to Colorado Springs. So that's that's kind of how that deal went. Wow.
that was that must have been a horrible experience. But uh, that's gosh, a condensed I'm, I'm version. Just, well, yeah, Steve, I'm just the, glad the you got over it. Is, huh? I'm just glad you got over it, man. Oh, I am too. I mean, people ask me all the time, "Do you, are you mad or upset or sad about the way you're taking out of your sport?" And I'm like, "Well, you know what? The way I look at it, if any of those tests that have come back positive, they were testing me for, I wouldn't be here because they were testing me for the." known stuff all the cancers you know the stuff that yeah. we normally yeah. uh, associate with with the symptoms i was having and uh and of course all the obscure stuff that's where it got that's where it got real that's where the that's where the frustrating part came in for me it was we figured out this is something obscure and it was hard figuring that out uh i credit mayo clinic for coming up with it and dr penny and this other guy out in colorado for helping with that but really there's nothing you do I mean, when you get when you get exposed to it uh, in scientific terms, the, the carbon monoxide, what it does, it displaces the oxygen molecule on your hemoglobin. In other words, your red blood cell, it's got the oxygen in your lungs and carries throughout your body. Well, the carbon monoxide, when it comes in there, it tells, tells the oxygen, move. You're not going to get on here. It displaces it. It hooks to the red blood cell, and it pumps through your body. Right. That's how carbon monoxide, mm. that's why it's so dangerous for people. So when you've got it in you, you know, yeah. you can go in a hyperbaric chamber or whatever and pressurize it out and all that. But, you know, normally it gets out of your system within a day or two. But the residual residual effects of me fighting it off for so many times and so many years, my body finally said, uncle, you can't fight it off any longer. It was kind of like Neil, you know, Neil and his head injuries. I remember yeah. Doc Petty yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, telling me that. Neil had used up his reserves, and if, I remember him telling me, "Susan could smack you beside the head." You know, Susie's wife, and and you know, basically kill you because you don't have any reserves left for head injuries. And it was kind of the same way with me with carbon dioxide. Right. right. All right, somebody do All something right. with the dog. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Rick. You're welcome, Steve. Uh. All right, our next question. Our next question comes from Bob Ellis, and as soon as I get him unmuted. Well, you've had Bob on hold the whole, the whole time, man. Well, you know. There we go. I'm telling you, you got to get faster at this, Rick. You've got to I know. To I know, man. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Look at Larry. He's got a good reason to background. Yeah, I got a question about uh, the 1991 uh, uh, Talladega race where you uh, helped Harry uh, Gant win the race. I want to know, um, was there any fallout or grudges held afterwards? Was there any what? I'm sorry. Was there any fallout, like what happened after the race? Uh, how, how many people's uh, feelings were hurt and uh, were there any grudges held later on? There were no grudges. The biggest fallout was Daryl. was just Daryl was better than a wet hen. And if you I've told this story many times. I think we did it on the junior download. They called me to the red truck. And, uh, I mean, I'm down here getting out of my car, and I got as many reporters around me as Harry's got in Victor Lane, it's like. And I'm down here telling reporters I didn't do it, I didn't push him, I didn't. And Harry's up there in Victor Lane on national TV saying, boy, I'm glad Harry. If Rick wasn't there, I don't think I'd have made it. I, I, I really appreciate it. I'm like, come on, Harry. But anyhow, Daryl. Daryl was bad because Daryl finished second, and he was in there, and I went to the red truck. He's in there. Uh, Dick Beatty's in or Yeah, Beatty's in there. Bill France Jr.'s in there, and Daryl just raising holy cane. You can't push a man across the finish line. You can't push him in the last lap. He's illegal. you got to disqualify Harry. I, I'm affected. I won the race. Just kept on. If I, I finally looked at me, and I said, what do you all want from me? Why am I in here, guys? What do you want? You know why you're in here, Rick Bass. You pushed him. I said, Look at the tape, man. I didn't push him. I may have busted and pumped him a couple of times. Anyhow, the door opens up. Jeff Hammond's at the door, and Jeff was Daryl's crew chief. And basically, he tells Daryl, Daryl, our car is in inspection, and our spoiler's too low. In those <laughs> days, we got a minimum spoiler angle in the rear. And, I mean, you'd move it two degrees, and you'd pick up two miles an hour. I mean, that thing was real sensitive. Well, sometime during the race, Daryl's crew had knocked that spoiler down, which you can't do, right? It's illegal. So he was at inspection line, and they saw the car was illegal. Uh, so uh, anyhow, Jeff said, Daryl, we got a problem. Daryl said, what's that there? Spoiler's too low. What do you mean it's too low? Well, it's not going to pass inspection. It's too low. Daryl stood there for a second, 
And I thought it was, it was either Bill France Jr. or Dick Beatty. He said, what do you think, Daryl? Daryl looked around. He says, boys, oh, Harry, that Harry's a hell of a driver, ain't he? I'll see y'all next week. And Daryl went out, went out of the, out of the truck because he knew, you know, he couldn't do that. And then when all that happened, you know, I didn't find out till later, uh, Dale had finished third, Dale Sr. So children didn't find out about, they're mad because I pushed Harry and then they're mad because Daryl's spoiler's low and they felt like they should have won the race. You know what I mean? But that, that part never got reported too much, but you know, it, it's, it's, and I'll be honest with you about maybe four or five weeks ago, I gave Daryl a call on the phone and we were talking and I was telling her, I was relaying that I just told that story on the Dale Jr. download and Daryl, it took him about 30 seconds. I got him going and I'm telling you in about 30 seconds, he got right back in time. I mean, it was just like, he reminded me of the way he was in that truck. He got mad. He got to fussing. He got not cussing, but he just raising cane on the phone. And I'm sitting here just laughing my butt off. I said, man, it's 25 years ago. And you're back at that same deal. Yeah, but darn it, Rick, it still makes me mad. I said, well, you shouldn't have cheated. Maybe you would have won. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Good story. Thank you very much, Rick. Oh, you're welcome, Bob. Take care, buddy. All right, Chris Perry, do you have a question? I do. I got a couple. Um, first of all, Rick, it's an honor. Um, if you would have told me as a five-year-old, 25 years ago, I'd be able to talk to people like you, I'd probably lose my mind. Um, <laughs> well, it's an honor to have you, man. Thank you. So my question, well, one of them is, is um, with your sickness, did you notice you'd feel like you'd have like a hangover almost feeling like the next day? Um, I run a dirt race car now and I've noticed some days I just feel like hell the next day, you know, and it's only 15, 20 laps. You know? yeah. Um, yeah. That well, the way I explain it to people, my deal was like the worst hangover you've ever had in your life. Right. And what happened, it would, it stayed with me every day. That's, that's what was so debilitating for me. Because before that, really, a couple of years before that, I would start having trouble after the race, like Monday and Tuesday. I would feel like I had a bad hangover, you know. And I was always pretty stringent about my workout routine. I was, I mean, I was honest, honestly an athlete. I mean, what I did, my routine was set up with the UVA trainers and the, all the support staff. They did this deal for me and with me. And, you know, I trained pretty hard. And uh, when that started happening a year or two, yeah, about a year really before I got sick, you know, you would, I would like Monday or Tuesday, Monday and Tuesday, man, it'd just be like the worst hangover you ever had. But then, you know, by the middle of the week, it would clear out and uh, you'd be okay. But when it finally came on, came on me the last time, it came on me and it would not let go of me, you know. So, and then that helped a lot of guys. A lot of drivers were having trouble. Uh, a lot of guys would be like Tuesday and Wednesday feeling bad after a race. And, you know, there's a lot of stories behind the scenes stories that went on with all this, with me talking to guys and having private conversations. And of course you got to understand in, in cup racing, especially in those days, there's 43 of us out there. And I was there for 12 years full time. And you literally got thousands and thousands. If you give anything to have your spot. So you never show signs of weakness. You've always got arrows being thrown at you and you have to dodge everything and protect your territory like a dog, you know? And uh, so you can't really, you can't really show any weakness or talk about it. So when I was going through my deal, you know, I got to a lot of guys that I raced with were talking to me and, you know, basically we came up with the, with the bow of the carbon, we call it the filter, but the deal now that changes of carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide is in the cool box. So once we got that, developed, all those problems went away, you know? So yeah, you're probably experiencing some of that, no doubt. Hmm, good to know. Um, and then my second part of this would be, so Bristol of 88. Now that's your first race. Yes. Um, you're running and then you get interviewed on TV and you say somebody knocked you out, but you really didn't elaborate and they didn't have a replay. So I'm just kind of wondering right. if you remember. <coughs> yeah, it was Kyle Petty, my buddy. We and Kyle was leading the friggin' race, man. We we yeah. go down the front straightaway. We done run 300 and some laps. My first time ever at Bristol. I'm still on the lead lap, right? Which is a feat in itself at Bristol. Come to find out after racing Bristol a little bit more, 
in a cup car. If you if you can run 400 laps at Bristol, you've still got all four fenders on the car, and you're still in the lead lap, you've had a heck of a night at Bristol, and you've got a shot at this thing at the end. You're going to have a good finish. The problem is getting to the 400 lap mark and still being on the lead lap with all your fenders on the car. So, you know, 300 some laps, I'm still in the lead lap. We go down the front straight, and we're going in turn one, the caution comes out. I don't know where the wreck is, but anyhow, I slowed down. Kyle's behind me, come down the front straightaway. I go through one and two, go down the back stretch. Kyle's leading the race. He still hadn't got out of the gas. You know what I'm saying? He's still wide open in the gas because he had just went by the start finish line and hadn't taken the caution, so he was st- had to race back too. When we go into turn three, and I'm already slowed way down. Kyle comes up on me real hard going into three and just pals me, right? And I go in the friggin' wall. And uh, it messes his night up, too. And, uh, you know, the reason that the reason I didn't have a problem with it, because I know Kyle Petty. I know how he races. And it's just, you know, it's just it's just a mess up. It's racing. It was just one of them racing deals, man. You know what I mean? Yep. And uh, so that kind of that kind of ended our day. I mean, it made a bad night for him, too. You know, yeah. and of course, he was all apologetic yeah. and on and on and on. He didn't have to be, but I, un- I understood the situation. And then my last small question for you, um, bias plays or radials in the Winston Cup days? What was bias your problem? Bias ply. I, did, I, I always loved bias ply just because you could, as a driver, man, you had so much more control over what you did. The bias ply, or a bias ply tire, if you if you got 30 pounds of air pressure in it, that tire measured a certain circumference. Right. It's a standard. Certain size. If you put 33 or 4 pounds of pressure, it gets bigger. Less pressure gets smaller, so you, you're always going to adjust your rear your rear stagger, right? And we have what we call front stagger too, but not really like the rear. But the, what was neat about bias ply, if your car, say your car was loose, okay, you could you could go in the turns, shortcut the turn, like enter like entering turn one instead of keeping sweeping out. You cut you cut down to the bottom and you go straight towards the center of the turn at an apex and grab the wheel and do that to it. And basically what you do, you slide the front tires, okay? So what, when you slide these tires, of course those tires heat up. And when they heat up, the air pressure builds. What happens, you build up a lot of pressure in your right front tire. It's just like screwing five rounds of wedge in the car. You right. The right. Car. And you can do the same thing if the car is pushing, you, you lay on the right rear. You know how you do that with accelerator and steering wheel. You put all the, the, all the heat in the right rear tire, get that tire hot, it'll grow, it'll loosen, it'll loosen up. So that was part of the, the that that's what to me that was the biggest thing that got taken away from us when we went from the bias ply to the radial. Okay, that plus the slip angle. The slip angle is a big deal. Bias ply, you had tons and tons of slip in the car both directions. A radial tire, there was no slip, and that's why so many guys had trouble with that thing. The tire was stuck, and if it's you felt it slipping a little bit, next thing you were wrecked. Okay, that 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 line of being of, of, of a good secure feel to slip angle to wreck, it went away with the with the radial. You were secure or you're wrecked. Bias ply, you were secure, slipping and sliding, then you wreck. But uh, you know, a lot of guys had trouble, and I, I've been first to admit, I you know, I, I had trouble adjusting to the radial tire. It took a long, went well, not long, but it took a while to figure out how to drive that stupid thing. You know, of course now it's it's it's. Uh, but anyhow, yeah, to answer your question, I I like bias ply. Cool. Thank you much. Thanks for your time. Yes, sir, sir. Take care. All right. Our next question comes from Josh Ward. Josh Ward. Josh, go ahead. Oh, you're getting faster, Rick. You're getting faster, man. Oh, he kept muting me, then I was unmuting it. it was a well, I'm, I'm under pressure. <laughs> hey, Rick, hey Josh, got, what's up, buddy? Hey, two quick questions. Did I hear in one of the podcasts you did that you had a chance to drive for Robert Yates? And then the other question is, what was it like driving for A.J. Foyt? Uh, yeah, I did with with Robert. And, you know, you look back and I always tell people I've got no regret, regrets. And I, I don't because looking back career-wise, you know, uh, probably a mistake. But at the time, you know, I had to do what I felt was right for – there are circumstances that, that led me to not do that. And that wasn't the only thing. There's some other, there's some other, couple other, three or four other actually opportunities that, you know, maybe being loyal 
to, to, to what I was doing, maybe keeping my word to what I was doing, maybe making sure uh, sponsors didn't go away from a team if I left and that leaves people without jobs. A lot of things figure into that. So, you know, career-wise, yeah, probably a mistake. But uh, looking back, I have no regrets over that. And uh, the second part, what was the second question? <laughs> what was it like driving for uh, – I know I threw a bunch at you. Oh, AJ. Like? Well, you know, yeah, yeah AJ. A, you know what was neat about AJ? I See, when I first met AJ Foyt, it was 1991. When I first signed to drive with Skull, I get on a plane, a private jet in Charlotte, and there, and see, AJ was sponsored by U.S. Tobacco. Copenhagen, which right? Was Copenhagen. Yeah. Yeah. So, Sco or U.S. Tobacco, they used to take us on trips. In the winter, they would take us guys on a trip somewhere, and in the summer, they would take all of the guys and their wives on a trip somewhere, and all the executives were Sco. So, anyhow, that first year, before I even drove for Sco in January, Got on a G4, man, in Charlotte. Me, A.J. Foyt, Snake Perdome. Snake was with uh, Skull, Harry Gant, and, uh, yeah, us and A.J. And then, of course, I think Tony George was on there, the guy, in Indy, the guy that runs Indy, yeah, and some executives with the company. And we go to Casa de Campo, Dominican Republic. So we were a week down there. But anyhow, I would spend two times a year with A.J., with Harry, with Snake, and, and, and uh, I got to know A.J., away from the racetrack right and just you know just he is what you think just funny egotistical prideful you know strong uh just you know he is he is what you think he is and just you know good guy so when it came up to drive for aj when aj first put that team together uh waddell was the crew chief or the manager of that team and, and they came to me about driving for him but you know i told waddell i said you know i, I know aj I think you need to have another driver in that car before I, you know, I just don't think I need to be the first driver because I know, I know kind of how AJ is. So anyhow, that's the way it worked out. And I forget who was driving and they came to me wanting to drive it. So I, and anyhow, I got in it and, uh, you know, we ran two or three or I don't know, just a couple of races. We were, we tried to, we were running and, um, uh, AJ come to me. He said, Rick, what's wrong with my race team? I said, well, I'll be honest with you, AJ. You've got – these are good cars, except you got bad geometry on the front. I mean, the, the cars were – I think were Hopkins cars, but they changed – they, we had changed some geometry in the front of those cars, we being some guys. And I says, you know, you need to take all these cars and put front snouts on these cars, put them back the way they were. I said, you really – the bodies on these cars aren't really that good. You don't have a lot of downforce to these cars. And I said, to be honest with you, your motors are weak. He said, well, damn. You're just telling me I ain't got nothing worth a dirt. I said, no, you got something that's very, very good. And he said, what's that? I said, your driver. I said, he's good. <laughs> so what he did from that moment forward, he ordered all his cars, sit back to Hopkins, have snouts put on. He got two or three different people to start hanging the bodies on those cars. And he went out and got a different motor vendor. Okay. He had told everybody, wanted to do motors for him, bring your motors here. They brought the different builders, brought motors to their shop. They put a motor in the car, run it on the chassis dyno. And whoever ended up with the most horsepower, that's who AJ went with. And honestly, to be quite frank, that's the way that deal went with me and AJ that whole season. We never, never had a crossword. You know, his deal was always what we got to do to make the car better. What do we got to do to make it faster? He was none, none of the bravado, you know, none of the stuff that you would typically think of the way it would be with AJ. Uh, behind closed doors, it was just, it was very professional, very, you know, very tuned in to what do we need to do to make this car faster, you know. And, uh, uh, and that was really, it was a neat deal. It was a very neat deal. You know, I was appreciative of that. Thanks, Rick. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. All right, our next question comes from Hallie Emery. Hallie, go ahead. Thank you, Rick. Hey, Rick, in, in 1991 and 92, you and Harry were running in Oldsmobiles. In 1993, you guys switched to Ford and Harry switched to Chevy. What caused that uh, the Jackson brothers both decide to run different manufacturers? Well, Leo was more in tune with General Motors. At that point, Leo which for everybody, Leo owned uh, Harry's car and Richard, his brother, owned my team. And Leo had a, 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 they were both good. We were both good with Oldsmobile. 
So Nosemobile got ran out. Uh, Chevrolet uh, basically offered up to Leo a lot more than they offered up to Richard. Okay. And Junior, at that point, Junior Johnson was, he was buddies with Leo and Richard, and, and Junior was an advocate for Ford. Uh, he was really trying hard to get Richard to switch to Fords. And it was a little easier in those, at that point, it was a little easier to make horsepower with a Ford than it was a Chevrolet. You could spend a little less money uh, and, and have a little bit better torque, maybe horsepower about the same, but you, your torque curve was a little longer, you might say, in, in, in a Ford motor, and you can do that. And uh, Ford stepped up to the plate and basically offered Richard more than what Chevrolet was. And that, you know, that's really what it boiled down to is just, you know, kind of a dollars and cents thing for Richard. All right, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome, sir. Uh, our next question comes from, Hall uh, comes from Jeff Markoski. Jeff, fire away. Thank you. Thanks for hosting us once again, guys. Um, and thank you for being with us, Rick Mast. Well, uh, along with Hallie's question, um, when both the Jackson brothers were running Oldsmobiles, were you kind of like a pseudo two-car team? And if so, what kind of things did you share if all, like chassis or engines? Nothing. Nothing they, at all? No. The, the, basically, the only thing was shared was the love between Richard and Leo. They had a love for each other but they also had a very competitive side. And, you know, in a perfect world, Sco would have loved for the two teams to be sharing, but it, you know, it just, it wasn't set up that way. I mean, Leo's shop was in uh, Asheville, okay, North Carolina, near Banjo's, the western part of the state. Our shop with Richard was right there in Denver. I mean, Denver, North Carolina, which is basically Charlotte. So, you know, completely separate deals that way. Uh, you know, for whatever reason, I, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, I'll give you a little secret, or not a secret, but I'll never forget we were at the deal I was just talking about, one of those deals with when all the drivers would be together in 91, I guess it was, with AJ. And I remember sitting, we were all sitting around, Harry, Richard, Leo, me, AJ, Snake, sitting around the house one night, and AJ was talking about the radial tire. And he was talking about an Indy car, the radial tire. He said, the biggest thing you got to worry about with the radial tire is don't get on the edge. Don't get on the edge of the tire. You got to stay off the edge. I'll never forget AJ saying that. Well, you know, Harry won all those races that year. Uh, what was it, four or five in a row? Five races. Yeah, there was a ridiculous amount. Well, Leo remembered that. Leo came back, and I think he was talking to Andy Petrie about it. They were the first to camber the rear ends. Mm -hmm. You know, the right. rear tires and camber. Mm -hmm. Leo picked up on what AJ said about not getting on the edge of that tire, and he put camber in it. And made it made because once we did it, man, you, it's like a completely different world the way the car acted and reacted. Mm -hmm. So I understood why Harry won all these races. But you know, when we found out about the same time, everybody found out. So if there were some kind of sharing going on, you know what I mean? Richard mm -hmm. and Leo would have shared that information, and it didn't happen, and it was a big deal. But you got to understand also. Two completely separate teams. Andy Petrie uh, was, was Leo's crew chief. And at the time, Bob Johnson was my crew chief. And there's no way that, that Bob and Andy would ever cross pollinate. Okay? No. The only way that would happen would be like today's world. You got one big building and all the teams are in there together every day. Mm -hmm. That's the only way. And I mean, even, you know, even today, I mean, it's that, that multi-car team deal. I mean, it went for years, man. Everybody fighting. I mean, you know, it's, I remember when, when Neil came to Junior Johnson's, when Daryl was there. I mean, it was the biggest fight that ever went on with Daryl. He did not want – he did not want a teammate in there, you know, and he fought against it internally, internally. And the same thing went on with Hendrick for the longest time. You had two or three real good, real good teams, but those guys would not share stuff. They would, And it just took time, years and years and years, before everybody kind of got around that to where they would start making, okay, this is – Instead of three different teams, this is one team with three different cars, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, it took a while for that to happen. So looking back, you know, I understand it completely. I understand it completely. I also heard it said that if Kevin Harvick didn't want to drive the 29 car, we number 29 car that you were going to. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, it. you know – Richard and I had a little bit of a history. We, we were like this close one time 
right before we lost Dale, me and Richard were like this close of doing a third team. And uh, it fell through at the last, the 12th hour. So Richard and I had a history of working together to try to make something happen. So it was kind of a natural type deal when, when that all went on with, with, uh, with senior. But uh, there was, yeah, we had some serious discussions there just a couple, three days. And uh, mm-hmm. a lot of things had to happen for this to happen. And at that point, but, you know, the problem was, I mean, Dale's my buddy, man. I mean, he, he was, you know, he was, uh, of course, he's my hero, but Dale was, was my buddy. Dale always, Dale never said no to me. Anything I'd go to him for, or ask, you know, he was always there for me. And it was, uh, I don't know, I, 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 when, when those discussions were going on pretty heavy for two or three days, I was having some mixed emotions because I was just, you know, I wasn't 100% sold on the idea of replacing Dale Earnhardt in his race car just because of my relationship with him. And I just, you mm-hmm. know, and as it worked out, I didn't have that decision. I, that decision, I didn't have to make a decision, okay? So that was, I looked at that as kind of a blessing because I'm still not sure, I'm still not sure how that would have, if I'd have done that, you know, I'm sure we'd have been successful. We'd have run good. Hopefully, won races and all that. But I'm just not sure mentally how that would work. How that would work for me over a period of time. You know, so yes. that's the way it is. All right. Thank you, Rick. Thanks again Thank for you, being sir. here. Okay, man. All right. Our next question is from Paul Sparks, Jr. Paul. Hey, Rick. How are you, sir? Well, what's happening, man? Hey, not much. Not much. We enjoyed watching down Dover. Just had a couple, couple, uh, couple uh, a few, one, one, one real cool question. Um, you had a lot of success at Dover. Uh, was it just the angle of entry, of your driving style, or just that you just had a, a preferred line, where you still maybe you kind of co-opted uh, Mark Martin's di- uh, dime in the corner of turn four, or a little bit more than that? Let me tell you, every driver has places that that they just like or they adapt to <clears throat> and really when you break it down what it amounts to at every racetrack or let's just take dover you you enter turn one you get out of the gas you go in you know what the car kind of needs to feel like in that point before it gets to the apex right through the apex after the apex and in the gas exit in the turn all the way through the turn the car needs to be f- doing a certain thing to be running optimum speed Okay, and for whatever reason, Dover was that track for me. I knew what my car needed to feel like entering the apex, through the apex, in the gas, out of the apex. I knew what the car needed to feel like to be competitive, to run fast. Don't know why, don't know what, but so then (laughs) when we get there, I could key in with the crew chief and explain what the car is doing right here and what I needed to feel like. And what the problem is with, with, with these race cars, you're always searching to try to get that feel. Okay, without affecting another part of the racetrack, but I could always dial the or, or, or always knew exactly what the car needed to feel like at certain parts of that racetrack. Uh, Mark was that way with Dover. All drivers have, have these tracks. All drivers have tracks that that, that fit them like that. And, and I don't know what cause. I've often thought why it is, or what causes it, or what what the deal is. But when you hear drivers talk about this is my favorite track, or I like this track better than any of them. 99% of the time, that's the reason. They know what the car needs to feel like to run fast, and they, they're able to dial in on that. And, uh, you know, you go to some – like me, my worst track probably ever was Hickory, a little short track. Hell, I never could figure out what you're supposed to do. That's the one, you know, and I, I had just don't, never had a clue what it's supposed to do there or what the car is supposed to feel like. But, but yeah, that – but Dover, that always made Dover special for me. So. All right. Uh, Rick, it's uh, about eight o'clock. How are you doing on time? Well, I don't miss Wheel of Fortune. I don't miss Jeopardy. I mean, my venison's done got cold. I might as well stay with you a little bit now. Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, Matt Miles has a question. Matt, are you with us? Good evening, Mr. Mass. How are you, sir? Hey, Matt. Oh, what's happening? Here. Man? Okay. Hey, I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate you talking to you on Twitter a couple of times. Okay. And um, being, being a Pennsylvanian, my friend, um, well, I have no love lost with uh, Mr. Spencer. And I, I heard oh, your story that uh, you uh, mentioned on the junior podcast <laughs> about a shotgun and, and uh, Mr. Spencer. 
And um, well, it wasn't really shocking. I was wondering if you could like, kind of talk through that a little <laughs> bit, and, and if you've sort of mended the fences there with Mr. Spencer over time. Oh yeah, I mean, excuse me. Yeah, I mean we. I mean after that all happened, you know, we, Jimmy and I, we the rest of our career. I mean, we raced. As far as I know, we never rubbed fenders, and. Mm -hmm. You know, we become good friends. I've become friends with his wife, Pat. I've become friends with his mom and dad, his brothers, even his sisters. You know, <coughs> it was like whenever whoever had any troubles or whatever going on, those guys were there kind of, you know, helping me, right? Mm -hmm. Mom was always cooking at the racetrack, and she would, if ever I was there, she would always send for me. Somebody say, Rick, come down and Miss Spencer got food for you. And I have to go down and eat with them. And yeah, it, it turned into, a, it tend, turned into a good, good relationship but i tell you i'll tell you uh, i'll tell you a real quick story and i did this on twitter the other night uh 1975 i'm still a teenager we've got that big block modified we see an ad in tri-state speed paper or whatever it was called tri-state big race in port world pennsylvania paying i forget what it was it mm -hmm. seems to be like five grand or something, I don't know what it was. But anyhow, we decided to go up there. And I'd never been out, hardly out of Rockbridge County, much less the state of Virginia. So we decided we're gonna to go to Port Royal. So we go up 81 and we get off, whatever exit it is, we go down through Carlisle. No, not Carlisle. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a school, a college to the left off of 81 going towards Port Royal. I forget, whatever it was. Anyhow, I remember we see as a girl walking a raccoon on a leash down the street. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's Shipp Shippensburg, Shippensburg, I believe, is where that okay. is. Okay. Yeah. Shippensburg, yep. I forget. <laughs> well, it's, a, it's one of the state ones up here, Shippensburg University. Okay, that's where it was then. So. And there's a girl walking a Freddy Rackley <laughs> down the street, right? So <laughs> we're going on up. We're getting close to Port Royal, so we decide we go fill the truck up with fuel or gas. So we stopped at a gas station, and they had gas attendants in those days. The guy comes out and waits on us. He's got a holster on with a gun, carrying a gun, right? I'm like, I don't know about this. Anyhow, we paid <laughs> go up the road, and before we get to the racetrack, it's past lunchtime. We get there early, and there's a diner, like one of those Airstream diner type things, right? Mm -hmm. so we stop to get lunch. Well, the woman we go in there and sit down to eat. Well, the woman our waitress waiting on us. Well, hell, she's got a holster on with a gun on her side, and I'm like, man, where are we at? Everybody's got guns. Even the waitress has got guns. So anyhow, we, you know, it was all cool. We went to the racetrack and, you know, we're practicing and uh, there was, I don't know how many cars, but it was like 10 o'clock that night when I qualified. I mean, it was mm -hmm. a godly amount of cars at this race. And I remember taking the checker. Flag. I took the green qualifying and when I took a checker, my bo I blew a motor taking the checker flag during the, during the qualifying lap. So, uh, <laughs> anyhow, we loaded, stuff, we loaded stuff up and come on back home. And... Uh, come to find out later, it's like 4.30 or 5 in the morning that race had finished, right? Well, years mm -hmm. later, years later, my mom always kept a scrapbook. Anything that was ever written about Rick Mash or whatever, she'd always do a scrapbook, and she'd give it to me each Christmas. Well, one time, years later, sometime in the 90s, I guess, I don't know, I was going through old scrapbooks, and I happened to come across, she'd cut out the article to that race. Guess who won that race? I bet that was Mr. Ed Spencer, probably Jimmy's dad. Ed Spencer <laughs> won the race. Guess who finished yep. eight? Guess who finished eighteenth? Uh, I guess Jimmy was driving that, so he probably probably would have been Jimmy in eighteenth. Yeah, Jimmy Spencer. It sure was, and I, I never knew it for you know fifteen or twenty years. I did not know that till I read that article, and then I went up to him and talked about that. You know, so that was a <clears throat> that was a neat experience going to Port Royal that night that day. And then one other real quick that uh, the folks who works with um, with the guys here hosting tonight uh, unearthed a video when you were at Nazca Speedway for the inaugural uh, Bush Grand National race there, and you had asked Mr. Penske for a ride. Now I did. I was. I won't tell you how old I, I was, but I was at that race. <laughs> okay. Okay. But yeah, that was, that was a hell of a finish too. I think you you passed uh, you passed through the wind there, going right to the start finish line. And then yeah. I believe you asked somebody for a ride immediately afterward. Okay. I'll have to watch that to see about that. I forget. I do know this. That was – I remember that race vividly 
Uh, the car, our car, it was a new car. It was a, man, it was a Vicus race car. You know, that was the first race for it. And that car, we did some, did, did, did a few things to that car during the, for the chassis for that race. And it just hit on something that worked, okay? But that, the biggest mm -hmm. thing, other than me winning that race, the biggest thing I remember about the, that race, that was Robbie Moroso's coming out debut. That was, and Steve and Rick remember this or know about it. But Robbie had come down here and moved and started racing with us. And he was kind of doing okay, not really setting the world on fire. But that particular day, Robbie ran the best he had run to that point. And he was actually leading that race. And Bob, Robbie's the one I had to pass to, 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 to win the race. And uh, from that race forward, it was like Robbie had a switch turned on. You know, Steve Bird, Birdie was a crew chief, his daddy, Dick Moroso, and all that. But that race is the one that really got, got Robbie – for whatever deal, or something with either Robbie or what they were doing with the cars. Mm -hmm. But after that, Robbie then became – he became awesome after that. So that was uh, – man, I hated to see that racetrack going away. I just hated it because it was a neat friggin' racetrack. Neat friggin' racetrack. Mm -hmm. I remember we went to – Yeah, that's we, – We went to a restaurant at that place in the morning getting breakfast. And we had our truck sitting outside in a car. And on the side of it had 22 and Rick Mast. Well, the waitress waiting on me, she said – is that y'all's truck and car race car race car? Yeah. Well, who is Rick Mast? I said I am. She says, "Well, I'm so and so." I said, "Okay, I have a son named Rick Mast." Okay. But up, <laughs> you know, a lot of Mast, especially Pennsylvania, are all Amish. Yeah. Okay? So mm -hmm. this is Amish land. So you know, so that's why I'm such a good guy. Wait, yeah. by the way, I got Amish in me, man. Got Amish in you. There you go. Yeah, yeah it was that, that track. It's that's practically my backyard here, uh, about a half hour away, and and I miss it. I drive past it going to work every day. So, but yeah, it's uh, yeah. it's yeah. terrible. It was it, it was an old dirt track that they paved and. Right, right. That was. Yep. I, think I appreciate that was your time, sir. Thank you. They paved it. I believe that was the first race after they paved it. Yep. Uh, it was. Yes, sir. Hey, we went back the second year. I had to race one the second year in a friggin' master cylinder. The master cylinder, the brake master cylinder. We had dual master cylinders. The friggin' seal, the the plunger seal. The plunger went down and stuck and held the brake pedal, held the brakes to either front or rear wheels and screwed up my day. But I'm telling you, we had their butt covered that day and didn't bring home the victory. Appreciate the time, sir. Yeah, appreciate the time, sir. Thank you. Thank you, bud. Okay, our next question comes from Phil Alloway. Man, you're getting fast, Rick. Have you done, man? Good for you. Hey, you put me under pressure. You've challenged me. I know. I know. <laughs> hey, Phil, Hi, what's Ray. up? Man? Pleasure having you here tonight. Um, I got a couple of questions. Uh, first, um, when you were full time in Bush Grand National, you did two races at Louisville Motor Speedway, which was at that time a point three five four mile flat oval. I, there are very few clips of that, and it looked like it was extremely narrow and very tough to race on. You didn't have much luck there, but uh, what kind of memories do you have of that place? I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you exactly what I remember about that place. It was 140,000 degrees that day, <laughs> is what it was. <laughs> oh, great God, it was hot. Sounds about right. To it was so hot. We were practicing on Saturday, okay, during the day. We had to stop. They came, the track was coming apart. They took their water trucks. They brought water trucks in there and they watered that track down, asphalt down, to try to get it cool enough for us to go out and do a little practice. They would cool that track down with water trucks. We'd go out. You didn't have to worry about drying the track. The water would turn to steam, man. It seemed like you go out and run maybe 20 minutes or so, they'd have to stop practice again because the friggin' asphalt was so hot, it was coming up. And uh, that's that remembrance, and that was the night. I don't know why we talk about Spencer so much, but that was the night that whatever happened to Spencer, I don't know what happened to Jimmy, but he got out of his car and he stood on, on the on the front straightaway on the inside of the racetrack looking up at the scoring tower where Robert Black, our competition manager behind the flag stand, looking up at the NASCAR officials, giving them the finger. <laughs> right right in front of right in front of the the, the the stands and everybody. I never forget riding around under caution watching is that it? Yeah, that's it, baby. That's it. That's hey, you it. know what that but, I mean, you know what that's from? Huh? 
second to none in the history of the Bad Car Bush series. I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. But I remember riding around under caution. We come around there and I seen him the first time. And I said, I went by and I'm like, no, that wasn't Spencer doing that, was it? I come back around the next time. I said, yeah, that's my boy Jimmy giving Robert Black and NASCAR <laughs> the finger in front of all, all the thousands of fans. That was the funniest thing. But yeah, it was a it was a tough, tough little, tough little racetrack. Yes, sir. You're right. What else do you get? All right. Um, um, when you were really getting going in the in Bush Grand National, they uh, introduced a bot the a bodies like the celebrity and uh, Pontiac Six Thousand and so on and so forth to the series. Um, it comes off as somewhat strange to me, but um. They had to get more modern bodies in the series since people were running stuff from the seventies prior to that. But um, did that really change much in the series at that time? The what it ended up being, Phil, was a test. Okay, because the cars just would not work. I built one. I had a celebrity. A lot of uh, because we were Chevrolet then, and we did a celebrity. But what they did, they made the wheelbarrow shorter. We were like maybe 112 inch wheelbase. Well, if you lose use that body style, and NASCAR was wanting us to use it, they decided we could use 105 inch wheelbase, which is seven inches shorter. Well, mm -hmm. and a shorter wheelbase race car mm -hmm. goes faster, okay? And or in, in theory it does, but for whatever reasons, geometry right wise, because basically what a lot of guys did, they used the same chassis. You just shortened the trailing arms. The rear hookup suspension, seven inches to make the mm -hmm. wheelbase short and make the cage smaller and all that. So you got a cage that's smaller, less metal. That means you can put more lead in the car, which in theory should make the car faster too. But there was something inherently wrong with the way we did those cars that they just never, they just could never handle as good as what we'd been using. And all of us used them. All of us tried them. All of us ran them. And they were especially treacherous on super speedways. I mean, every the first time everybody took one to the Super I, where I don't know where we went, and there, a lot of guys showed up the little cars. Man, they were white knuckled when they got out of the car, scared to death because you just couldn't hold on to the cars. And uh, then on the short tracks, they just didn't they just didn't handle as well. So you know they were kind of short lived. Uh, I remember Earnhardt had one, and he ran. I think we were Darlington, one of the big tracks, and he ran decent with it. And I remember after the race, he was just cussing, raising the hell. He said, don't bring that thing back ever. Back, back. Don't, don't, he, I remember telling telling what's his name, don't even take it to my shop. Don't even take it back to the shop. I don't want to see this car again. You know? So, uh, yeah, that was a push. You're exactly right. That was a push to be a little more modern because a lot of us were still using the old Pontiac Venturas, uh, Grand Ams, Onovas, you know, and they were trying to introduce us to, to, to newer styles. And that that's what that was about. But it just didn't work. All right. Thanks, Rick. Thank you, sir. Have a good night. All right. Um, our next question is from Gary Bryan. But Gary, before uh, you ask your question, if everybody would maybe limit themselves to, to one question, uh, we, we've got a little bit of a backup. and I, I'm sure we're not going to be able to get to everybody. So if you could just limit yourself to one question, uh, that, that would respect uh, Rick's time and uh, hopefully get to everybody or get to as many people as possible. So, Gary. Yeah, hey, guys. Hey, Rick, thanks for taking the time. Uh, I'm going to actually change my question a little bit from what I had. Um, I'm an Indiana guy, and when I think of Bush Grand National Racing, I think of Indianapolis Raceway Park. I'm kind of curious what your thoughts were racing there. Was it good to you? Kind of. What do you think of it? Yeah, the first, the first time we went out there, Another one of those places, man, you just fell in love. with. It was such an exciting time for me because to be in the Bush Series at that point, and they were expanding the Bush Series, we got to go to a lot of the new venues for the first time, kind of like it was through the 90s with me with the explosion of the Cup Series. It was a perfect time for me to be there. But during the 80s, and IRP was one of those tracks, the first time we ran there, we had to run – somehow or another we had to run qualifying races or heat races or something. I forget what it was. And I remember I won one of them. I remember Tommy Ellis won one of them. Uh, but the, <laughs> the funny stories about that place, we had a, I had a guy help me on the team. And it was definitely, 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 definitely scared of snakes, right? Well, you know, they got those big 
gas storage tanks off of one of those turns of the field. Yeah, on the back two, street, yeah. back, a great big cornfield at that time. It was big, this biggest cornfield I ever saw in my life. And it kind of backed up to the back straightaway of that racetrack. Well, it was Hubert Hensley, Jeff Hensley's daddy, which was Jimmy Hensley's owner and his crew. They had set this thing up. They knew that Paul, the guy helped me scare the snake. Well, they set this thing up for a day and a half, had all the guys up and down pit road, always talking about snakes coming out of that cornfield whenever my guy Paul would walk by. I mean, they set this thing up perfectly. Every time he turned around, if Paul was going by somebody, they were talking about snakes. I don't – it's kind of like the uh, – what was that torque wrench or valve spring wrench or something in cup that everybody was sending these these new mechanics looking for, right? Uh, but anyhow, so finally, I guess the day of the race, they – somebody had a rubber black snake and they threw on Paul and he ran from one end of that garage to the other. Everybody was laughing. But uh, 1990 at our RP, we were uh, running. I was running my own team then. And maybe 18 or 20 laps to go, I passed Chuck Bound to take the lead. And mm-hmm. at that point, it was the second half of the season and I was, my sponsor had went belly up. They had left in the middle of the night. I had tons of bills unpaid and uh, worked it out with my creditors. They worked with me. But, you know, down to your last nickel, you might say. And, you know, that win, that race always paid well. It, the RP paid well in those days. So all I had to do is just finish the race. I come off turn four after getting the lead, come up on a lap car, most of me the outside. I go by him, go down the front straightaway into turn one and, I don't, to this day, don't know what he did. It, I guess he just lost it. But anyhow, he just nailed me, put me in the wall, took me out of the race. Oh. You know? So that wasn't, that wasn't a, that wasn't a, a, a great experience. But man, I love that racetrack. Those guys, they would fill those stands up and then they had all the grass area and people was, they, the place was packed with people all in the grass watching this race. Yep, I was one of and, them. And, uh, <laughs> And I think he, I, gave, I think the guy's name was Bob Daniels. Mr. Daniels was the owner promoter of that racetrack, and he was just as welcoming and as accommodating. I mean, just really treated. When we first showed up there, he just he treated us like like gold. You know what I'm saying? And we were always very appreciative of of, of any promoter that acted like that. But he was the first promoter really that went out of his way to really treat us like we were something special to be there at his racetrack. We were always just in awe you know, and humbled to be in these new venues and showcase and showcase in the Bush series. You know, it was a neat deal for us at that time. So, uh, yeah, I love that racetrack. Awesome. Thank I you. Sir. I appreciate back, your time. I wish they could go back to it. <laughs> yes, I agree. Yes. All right. Our next question comes from Chase Whitaker. Chase, go ahead. Good evening, Rick. Too much country. Hey, See ya. Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. Hey, uh, I'm going to do kind of like Gary did and kind of call an audible as well. I was going to ask about another one, but uh, since we're going to go back to another track and, and, and maybe this has got some future left in it as well as Nashville. That's one of your nine wins. Um, for whatever reason, um, the local papers used to have really good coverage of the local track. I don't know if they just had a falling out with um, the promoter back in those days or whatever, but that race didn't get a lot of coverage locally. And so I'm, I'm curious about what's your memories of that day back in 89 of, of running here at the fairgrounds. Um, and, and looks like, a, based on the stats, looks like Kenny Wallace had, had led the sizable part of that day. But uh, in the end, when it mattered, you were up front and, and beat out Bobby Hamilton. So uh, take us back through that day a little bit and winning on that old historic track. Yeah, we had never, of course, first time going to Nashville. I had never been there. And, uh, we get there, and we had somehow or another, we found out about a guy that, that had run there, very, very successful there as a crew chief and uh, with some different drivers. And somehow or another, we got him to help. When we got there, he was there with us, and he helped us a little bit. And uh, you know, my car, I'll never forget my car in practice, old time. I was real tight off turn two, real tight off turn two. We couldn't. The car ran good. It turned good. But in the gas, I just couldn't get off turn two right. And uh, he made a suggestion with front springs to make a change. And we did. And it set my car on cue, right? Wasn't quite as, it wasn't quite as fast on cold tires 
but after I ran a little bit, I really liked the way the car came in and the way it helped. I, I ran, I told him, I said, I think this thing, when the track gets rubbered up and slicked up, it just feels like the car is going to really set sail. And that's kind of what happened. And the guy's name was Gil Martin. You know, if everybody on here remembers Gil Martin, I mean, Gil went on to be very successful with Richard Childress and some other folks. And, uh, but yeah, we waxed old Kenny. I, I enjoyed outrunning Kenny that night. He, he led most of that race. And I, it was another one of those deals like Louisville. I remember it being far, hotter than 40 hells down there, man. It was just so friggin' hot at that place. But I also remember Jimmy Hensley telling me about the first time he went to Nashville, which was years before that. That's when evidently that track had a real, real steep banking. I don't know if everybody remembers that about it or not, but it was a real steep banked racetrack. And Jimmy talked about the first time he went there and he says he's walking down through the, through the pit area and he walking with somebody, some local and he seen a guy in a wheelchair. He said, who's that? He said, oh, that's our track champion. And he went down through a little bit further. And there was a guy on crutches walking with a cast. He said, well, who's that? Well, he's the guy that won three races in a row here. And Jimmy, he said, what's wrong with all these people? He said, well, you race here long enough, you get broke up, you wreck and you get hurt. Jimmy says, I don't know if I want to race here or not like that. I never forget Jimmy talking about that. But by the time I went there, we went there for the Bush Series, they'd taken a lot of that banking out of it, you know. And again, that's another one of those trucks they keep talking about. I, I'd love to see it on the, on the Cup Series. I'd love to see it on our schedule. Whether it happens or not, who knows. Thank you. Yeah, that's absolutely right. You're probably talking about Jimmy Gregg then got hurt badly and sticks down 70, and that's when Daryl came of age and Daryl would often say that's one reason he yeah. ran Bristol so well is because he could run those Nashville high banks in his late model days. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I agree with that. I'd heard that. I'd heard that same thing, yes. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, sir. All right, Rick, how are you doing on time? Are you okay? Or Houston, I'm fine, man. Keep it going, dude. Okay. All right, man. No one's going to get past your bedtime. I know Wade. Wade's already asleep. Well, you know, he has left us, and I've, I've not ate supper yet. So, you know, that, that's how it goes. <laughs> okay. Um, well, look, at, look here. I still got some, still got some venison left. See that? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Chris Wolf, do you have a question? Yes, sir. My first, um, my first memory of uh, following Rick Mass would be the 1989 uh, Daytona 500, and he almost had a – Almost could have, should have had a uh, Derek Cope uh, Cinderella story there at the Daytona 500. And uh, I remember that he was drafting with um, Earnhardt and uh, Kenny Schrader the majority of the day. And then at the end, he kind of lost the draft. So I was wondering if he had any stories to tell us that, uh, from his memories of that day. And uh, Yeah, that was, a, that was a special day, man. Thanks, thanks for remembering that. I like your hat, by the way. They get, how do you get those hats? How, do, how does one get one of those hats, by the way? You become a Patreon supporter, baby. <laughs> yeah, I knew money was involved somehow. But anyhow, yeah, that was a special time, a special race. Uh, yeah, it was me and Art Schrader. We, I, you know, I was down there first time in a cup car at Daytona, man, an unknown in an unsponsored car on television out there running with Earnhardt and Schrader up front all day. And, you know, what, what, what it really boiled down to, we – Everybody had pitted a lot of whatever the deal was. I finished that race with the left sides. Honest to God, when we came in after the race, both left side tires were into the cord. But you know what was so neat? That car handled so great. I could still hold it wide open. I didn't have to lift. I'd go and turn one, especially the last 10 or 15 laps. I'd go and turn one or turn three wide open and not lift. And that car would just drift all the way up the racetrack to somewhere between one foot to three or four foot away from the wall. You know, but I didn't have to do anything but hold on to it and hold it wide open. It was just a great race car. And, but what happened, we, me, Daryl, uh, uh, I mean, Schrader, Earnhardt, they got away from me a little bit, but I was still okay. And Travis Carter, my team owner, he was trying real hard to put, put a deal together. He didn't have a sponsor. You know, he had his team, but he didn't have money. We had money enough to run like the first three races. And he was, uh, you know, he'd, he'd been on TV all day. You know, his, his car had run up front all day. And a lot more to that story. 
the back back side of that story. But basically, what I'm telling you is is what's important. And he did not want to he did not want to embarrass himself. Hinky Eanes, our our gas man at the time, kept telling Travis, "We can make it on fuel. We can make it." Well, everybody pitted me, Schrader, Earnhardt. We all pitted except for old DW. DW's about a half a lap behind us, lagging back, saving fuel. Well, when we all pitted, Daryl didn't pit, and he won the race. Well, Hinky was so upset about it when the race was over, he made him take the top off the fuel cell. I remember being there watching. Hinky was mad. They took the actual top off our fuel cell in the garage before he loaded, and he went in there and he measured the amount of fuel, and he figured it out. that we had, we had enough fuel to make it to the end. And if Travis would have listened to Hinky, we'd have won the friggin' Daytona 500, and Daryl still wouldn't have won one, you know? But you know how things are meant to be. Sometimes they're not meant to be. So that was uh, uh, that was one of the most memorable, enjoyable times I ever had at a racetrack. Because really, we was down there for a week, a week and a half. We ran the Bush Class the week before, and, you know, we were right there with them again. I mean, I, finished with, I think we finished sixth or seventh or something in the Bush Class. And, you know, right in the middle of it, the car ran great all week. You know, we're drafting up for, with all the fast cars and running with all the fast cars. And that was the race that really, at that time, that was a race that, well, it got my name known in America because of CBS coverage. But most of the cup guys knew who I was to some extent because they'd seen this blue 22 on Saturdays running to get, and that's how I got in Harry or. Travis Carter's car because Harry Gann had been Travis's driver for years in that that was a skull car and he would see on Saturdays when Harry was running Whitaker's car or whoever this blue 22 up there mixing it up with his driver and like with Dale or Tim Richmond uh you know Neil those guys uh, at Darlington and Charlotte there's this regular Bush guy in a blue 22 up there running with this guy we got to keep our eye on him so that's what enabled me to get in that car, Travis, just to begin with. And then when we ran so well at, at, at Daytona and all, then that that really put the eye on me as far as everybody in the Winston Cup area then then really started showing interest in, in what I was doing and trying to accomplish. So that that race really propelled me, it propelled me in a lot of ways. So cool, very cool day. Okay, I think we have reached the end of the line. I think we have one more question, uh, and it will come from Michael Massey. Michael? Hey, Rick. How you doing? Hey, Mike. Uh, I was going to ask, can you hear me all right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. I was going to ask you about uh, Alan Dillard was your father-in-law, right? Correct. Um, I got. He moved to – he ended up moving up to Cup with Ward Burton. Correct. Do you think that he should have just stayed in the Bush series and he would have had, you know, more success, you know, like he did with you and with Ward if he'd stayed in the Bush series? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, because it was, it was easier to do financially. But, you know, his goal was always to, to, to get into Cup. That's what he wanted to do. And, you know, uh, I guess 88 and 89, me and him did a team together. And so the 88 and 89 seasons – in the Bush series, that was mine and Mr. Dillard's car together. And then at the end of 89, we split. I went back on my own with my car, and then he, he went on his way. He did started out with Elton, Elton Sawyer. Then he ended up with Ward. And they had, uh, I guess it was Gwaltney. Gwaltney was your sponsor. Then when he went to Cup, you know, he landed to deal with Hardy's. And, you know, the, those guys, I mean, they had, he had put together a, a, a good race team. I mean, he had – he had uh, – Golly, he had Philippe Lopez was there. Uh, Freddie Fryer was there. Probably the greatest shock man that the sport has ever seen, Ronnie Crooks. Ronnie was there, right? These guys were younger then, okay, but very talented guys on that team. Ronnie went on to become the, the shock specialist at, at Joe Gibbs Racing through all the wins and championships with Bobby and, and Tony Stewart and those guys. And uh, – you might not know that name, but in the garage area, I mean, he's like Elvis with shock absorbers, you know, Ronnie was. And, but, you know, the money, the the financial part is, is, is what finally got Mr. Dillard. You know, I mean, you can't, you know, he, he had a successful company that he built and ran himself for 50 years. And 
but I don't care, you know, what kind of company you got. You those companies like that doesn't support a race team. You've got to have you got to have a major corporate sponsorship to do that. But to answer your question, yeah, maybe uh, it probably could have kept running longer because the financial part of it wasn't well, nearly nearly as uh, taxing, I guess you'd say. But you know that wasn't what Alan really wanted to do. Alan Alan wanted to wanted to be in Cup and run well, and and they did as short lived as it was. He still. You know, they they made an impression over the short period of time, but they definitely made an impression. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for answering. Oh, thank you, sir. All right, uh, Rick. Man, yes, sir. Thank, thank you so much for your time. Uh, if you want to stick around, we're going to do a trick. Uh, we're going to do a, a quick trivia co uh, trivia contest. Uh, and uh, Fred Pecky is not on the call, so everybody has a chance to catch up from last week. So, Rick, thank you again for your time. Oh, I really thank do you, appreciate Rick. it. Anytime, man, maybe the next book. And I will tell everybody, you were very generous in your next book. You know, the greatest race of all times, the 92 Hooters 500. And uh, you were, yeah, you were very accommodating for Rick Mast in that book. And I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, man. Thank you. All right. Goodbye, fans. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. Thank everybody. Keep supporting the scene vault, man. They need the support. We need the support. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is everybody still with me? All right, cool. Uh, listen, what I want to try to do this week, um, rather than the first person to answer, everybody who gets the answer correct will score a point. Okay, so the person with the most points at the end of the month will get a copy of either Dale versus Daytona or NASCAR's Greatest Race. It'll be your choice. So uh, to, to make it, uh, to, to see if we can do it a little bit better uh, and maybe not the quickest typist or whatever, uh, let's go ahead and everybody who gets the question right will score a point. Okay, is that, is that cool with everybody? All right. All right, now, question number one. What rival crew chief did Andy Petrie exchange information with following races in the 1990s? Okay. All right. Looks like everybody has their, their answers in. Uh, it would be Ray Evernham. Uh, and I, I'm going to be honest with you, that was probably one of the most surprising things that I've learned here on the podcast, doing the, doing the interviews. When, when he said that, I was, I was shocked because you had the crew chief for Dell Earnhardt sharing information with the crew chief for Ray Evernham. And evidently from what, uh, from what Andy said, he, he said that they shared basically everything. Uh, that was going on with those race cars. So that was that was pretty revealing, I thought. All right. Question number two. Who was Diegard's first driver? All right. Very good. The answer is, of course, Donnie Allison. All right. Question number three. There is an official answer to this one, and then there's a correct answer to this one. How many wins does Bobby Allison have? All right. Okay. The correct answer, the official answer is 84. The correct answer that I'm looking for is 85. All right. Number four. Who did David Pearson consider to be the greatest driver of all time?
Okay, looks like everybody's in. The answer would be David Pearson. Um, and listen, as a reporter, you, you come up with questions and then you come up with throw, what you consider to be throwaway questions to just kind of maybe keep the conversation going. And that was one of those questions for David Pearson that I had when I interviewed him. Um, I honestly thought that he would, you know, give a politically correct answer and say, well, Richard Petty was pretty good and Bobby Allison was pretty good and Kelly Yarbrough was pretty good and Curtis Turner was pretty good and I raced against all of them. And so I would be in the mix somewhere. And before I had the question out of my mouth, David Pearson said, I am. So when I, can, when I expected David Pearson to be politically correct, I evidently didn't know David Pearson very well. He let it rip. So David Pearson is correct answer on that one. <clears throat> now here's one for you. Number five, how many current members of the NASCAR Hall of Fame have been interviewed on the Scene Vault podcast? Okay, believe it or not, we have interviewed 13 members of the NASCAR Hall of Fame for the podcast. And that has been, that, that's been, and honestly, that's not something that we set out to do. That's not something where Steve and I said, you know, we're going to go interview members of the NASCAR Hall of Fame. We just happened to be able to get up with those people and yeah, we, we've, we have interviewed 13 members, 13 current members of the NASCAR Hall of Fame. All right. Number six, Bobby Hillen once wore a helmet featuring which Major League Baseball player? And there's actually two correct answers for that one. Very good. The answer was Mark McGuire. Mark was, of course, a part owner in that race team. Uh, Bobby at the time had a, a, a handful of professional athletes who were co-owners in his team. Uh, Gary Gaetti, who played for the Twins, uh, played for, I believe, the Angels. At one point, he was a part owner in that team. Uh, Danny Schaefer, uh, who Bobby mentioned when we talked to him a couple of weeks ago, or last week, uh, Danny was a, a journeyman uh, uh, player. Uh, and I'll never, I'll never forget, uh, my son Richard was at a race at IRP, and Danny was at that race, and so my son was a big uh, baseball fan, and so I thought I was going to be really cool and introduce my son to a a an actual walking, talking, living, breathing, current Major League Baseball player. I introduced him to Danny Schaefer, and my son's very first question looked him dead in the eye and said, so are you any good? <laughs> and, you know, I, I had to explain to, I had to explain to Richard very, very quickly that even though Danny Schaefer was a journeyman, journeyman, uh, baseball player and didn't get to play a lot. He was still better than the vast, vast, vast majority of players. So number seven, Rick Mast finished second to Dell Earnhardt at Rockingham in the fall of 1994. What was significant about that day for Earnhardt?
Very good. Uh, that was the day that he clinched his seventh Winston Cup championship, which of course tied him at the time with Richard Petty. Um, and there were still uh, two races to go in that season. So a lot of people tend to point to that season as a, as a, as a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? As a, as a reason that the chase, that the current format is in place. Um, think of that what you will. So, uh, yeah, he clinched that championship with uh, two races to go that year. Number eight, where was Steve's first newspaper gig? All right. Steve's first, very first newspaper gig was in Martinsville. Okay. Then he went to Roanoke and then he went to Grand National Scene. And Edwin, my first job was in Sparta. <laughs> All right. Number nine. Buddy Parrott once gave demonstrations in what sport early in his NASCAR career? Very good. He gave demonstrations in diving. So you guys are very good. Uh, the, the story goes, according to, according to Buddy, he was diving off the roof of the hotel where they were staying into the pool at the hotel. And he said that he had Buddy Baker scared to death that he was going to splat. <laughs> All right. Number 10. Last question. The Scene Vault podcast has had four guest hosts. Name one of them. Extra credit for more than one. All right. We've had four guest hosts. They were Kelly Crandall, Tony Rambo Liberati, Dennis Punch, and Rick Mast. So most of you guys got at least a couple of those. So uh, that about does it. Uh, I'll tally these up and I'll give uh, a quick update. Uh, next week. Hopefully you can join us. I uh, don't know who the guest is going to be yet. Uh, I've put out a couple of feelers, thought I had one lined up, uh, but it was it turned out to be his wife's birthday. So uh, we will line that up uh, for, uh, for uh, down the road. And I will say this, it's a member of the NASCAR Hall of Fame. So we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to continue to get uh, quality hosts or quality guests here on the show. So again, thank you guys so much for being here and listen, share this on social media and let your friends know about it. Let your followers know about it. Uh, hopefully you've had a good time. So we will talk to you next week.